Okay, cool. Okay, so we can just jump straight into demos. Uh, Lizzie Hansen, do you two want to go first? Yeah, we can do that. Uh, Lizzie, do you have a pulled up? Did you want to do the uh, show the feature and I could do the code? Sounds good. Okay, you guys can hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Desktop one, that's the one. All right. And let me get this launched. How's everybody's Sunday going? <laughs> Good. That's a good uh good way to stall while you're <laughs> getting stuck. <laughs> Story. It was really smooth. <laughs> what branch do I want? I want oh my gosh, we have so many you guys now. Uh should work off main, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it should is. work off main. You merged it, yeah? Yeah. Okay. I see you did some decorating in your terminal. Looks good. I did, yes. Oh, yes. Nice. <laughs> Tim. Okay. So here we are in our list. And our task was to make it so that if an existing, if you try to add an item that's already on your list. So for example, I've got apples on my list. If I try to add apples again, we should get this error message that you've already added the item to your list. Um, the challenge was making it so that if you tried to add apples with exclamation points, it should also recognize that, or all uppercase apples, it should recognize that. So uh, it needs to take, our app now takes the user's input and compares it to every item that's currently in the database. But first we take kind of a sidestep and we normalize that data. So we're checking apples to apples, if you will. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, it was a looked like a short and sweet task, but there was uh, some added complexity. So, and also, if you add spaces between your text, it still recognizes that. So, just one apples. And Hanson, you want to show us the code behind it? Yes. Let's see. All right, so. For the code, first we declared a function, uh, normalize text, and this is going to grab the item and remove the XX spaces, the punctuation, the special characters, and then with the two lowercase, it's gonna make all the letters lowercase. Um, then we also declared another function called check if item exists. And essentially what this is gonna do is loop over the items in the database and Compare the normalized database items with the normalized user input item and then return true if it if they exist and or if they're equal and return false if not. And so if you see down in this the try catch block, uh, we call the we're gonna normalize the item name, then um, we're calling that check if item exists function. And then so if it returns true, it's going to set this set the status of you already added this item to your list. And we also set a timeout function. Um, with, so within three seconds, that message will disappear. And then we also do the same thing here for if the user input like a space or an empty input, um, it'll show an error of please enter an item and then disappear about in like three seconds. And I believe that's pretty much it. Yeah, is there any questions, concerns? That's really good. I really like that you added the timeout feature. I never would have thought of that. That looks really great. Yeah. And then uh, thank you to Olivia and Tim for suggesting I put the put it in the function and make the code a lot more drier. It looks really clean. And we, we love dry code. So thank you. Yeah. I was going to call that out. Is that That's nice to see just kind of a, you know, because you're doing it in more than one place. So pulling it out into a separate function. Um, that's cool. The, um, if you can go up to the, um, the normalize function. Um, I, I've never seen anybody split on like uh, spaces, like the that kind of regular expression of the space plus before. Um, and I, I understand exactly why you're doing because it, it could be multiple spaces between, you know, two parts of the um, the phrase, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think it would have worked just as well to s just split on one a single space because the next thing you do is you're just going to join it back together as a as a string, right? So it would just ignore right. all those empty. 
array things, but um, it's kind of cool to see. I didn't actually know you could do that. So I, just, I learned something today. Thanks. Oh, sweet. <laughs> yeah, we definitely got into the, the bowels of regex this week. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Tricky. How and did you Tim, manage? Tim brought up the. Oh, go ahead. How How did you manage to do like app space le, and also account for like apple space sauce? Because I thought that we couldn't do that. So, what magic did you work? Uh, Hanson, you want to take this, or do you want me to? Uh, you can take. You can take first shot. <laughs> <laughs> so I I see what you're saying. So like. Uh, cause that, that was the issue that we ran mm -hmm. into, right. Is we can't just strip out all the spaces mm -hmm. because then you can't have applesauce or green beans or ice cream. And so what we did is we decided we're not going to alter what the user can put in. So if the user wants to type their item in all uppercase with all sorts of crazy punctuation, that's fine. We're going to save it like that. What happens is when whenever they put a subsequent item in, that's when we do the checking. And so when we do the checking, that's where we strip out all the spaces. So for example, if the user put in applesauce, when we're doing that check with the normalized, I think it's the normalized text function. Yeah. That's where we're stuffing everything together into one word. So applesauce oh, God, God. is yeah. recognized just as applesauce, one word without spaces. Got it. Yeah. Oh, cool. I like that. That's a good solve. We really, that was the part that we really struggled with was how do we still let the user put two mm -hmm. words in? Mm -hmm. that, that was the thing that we ended up spending, you know, 80% of our time on. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great, that is a great solve for that. It's actually kind of generally, whatever the user inputs, you want to save that as is because you never know what other ways you might want to transform it in the future. So unless there's some like, um, unless you need to sanitize it or something like to get you know, like it's like a security thing. You might want to try to strip, strip some stuff out, but otherwise, yeah, that makes a lot, a lot of sense. And then the user gets what they expect too, right? Like they're, um, you know, if they typed it in all caps with exclamation points, because they're really excited about Applesauce. Yeah. You want them to mm -hmm. be able to have that. Very cool. Nice. Okay, cool. So now you find Olivia, go ahead. Cool. I'll start with the demo and then Olivia will walk through the code base. One moment. Can you all see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. So this week's text is really interesting because we're starting to make the shopping list smart. Um, so if I click on sushi, as you can see, the Oh, maybe I need to pull this over a little bit. Let me do it again. Okay, now we can see some magic happens and then the, we start to predict the next purchase date. And then start the second one, third one. Nana, and then once you we start um, on click it, you will turn back to the original date. Another functionality we added is once we click on one item, if we refresh it, we disable the checkbox. And there's a there's a reason for it. And Olivia will walk through the code. So that will be even more uh, apparent. Could you click on banana a couple of times more? Sure. Third one. And I'll check it and then check it again. Oh, okay. It is rolling back the number of total purchases. Cool. Nice. Cool. And hot pod. I buy a lot of hot pod during the winter. <laughs> As you can see every single day. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> cool, Olivia. Yeah. So, um, yeah, last week to catch you up, Andrew, uh, Hanson and I decided we're tasked with um, the clicking of the checkbox functionality. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, what if we could unclick it? I wasn't really mm -hmm. in the ask, but I was like, hey, what do, what do we think? So we jumped in and originally um, 
we were just resetting, we were just decreasing the amount purchased by one and resetting the date last purchase to null. But then we realized this week that that was not setting us up for success because we needed that date last purchased item in order to calculate the next purchase date. Mm -hmm. So we had that kind of functionality to work through. Um, and UFO was a was a trooper because I feel like I kind of put us in that situation, <laughs> but we had a lot of fun. Um, so uh, yeah, so the first thing um, we did is we declared a couple pieces of state for the previous state last purchased and the previous state next purchase, which on click of the button, we save into state to have that in case the user wants to unclick the item. Then we call the update item function here with those two pieces of state, as well as another piece. And it's not a technically a piece of state, but it's derived from state, the, the was purchased state. Um, so that way we can have those three pieces of information to know the status of the button, and then what the previous dates in the database were. So then if you pop over to that update item function, we pulled the date next purchase, date last purchased, and total purchases from the database, manipulated those to the dot to date method, and then figured out the number of days between those dates, and then pop passed all those dates to that calculate estimate function and save that in a variable. And then um, getting to your update doc function, it's all done conditionally. So depending on if was purchased is true or false, you'll either set to the previous date last purchase piece of state, so it can go back, or you'll set it to your new date um, and the future date that we got from the calculate estimate function, and then increase or decrease your total purchases um, accordingly. Um, yeah, and then for the first time you purchase an item, um, if you don't have a date last purchased, we use the date created in order to calculate that estimate. Um, and then um, after we got that done and we were feeling good, we noticed that if you go to the, the app on page load and something is already clicked, if you're going to unclick it, you don't have that piece of data saved in state. So you can't then use that function because you've got null values. So then we played with defining on component load those dates, but then I felt like we had a, a user interface error because you could debt, you could like reset the date last purchase, but because it was checked, it's been purchased within 24 hours. So the button would not uncheck. So in order to make the user interface feel like a little bit more intuitive, we would disable that button. So on page load using this use effect, we say if on page load, the item is marked as purchased, disable that button, gray it out so you can't uncheck it. And then we've communicated to the user right now just with the title property to say um, not available for bill, oof not available for purchase until 24 hours have passed since the previous purchase. And then if you are able to purchase it, it'll just say, did you purchase the item? Nice. Yeah. It was, this was a fun meeting one. I had a hoot and a half with this. It was <laughs> great working with you fun, digging through all these like little problems we set ourselves up for. Yeah. Oh, really quick. Can you also show the dates.js mm. to show the days between dates? Function. Totally. That's it. Yeah, so this is our um, number of days between date function that we wrote for this. Um, yeah, we convert the two dates that we passed in in the Firebase JS file um, into milliseconds, compared the difference, and then rounded it up to an even day. Nice. Yeah. I feel like this is that's such a the whole thing that you went through of like, oh, if we do this, then it means a bad user experience. All that kind of stuff is so realistic. Like that happens all the time. Um, and like you approach it with empathy and like realizing, oh no, we don't want to like confuse our users and all that kind of stuff. Um, and seem to have landed in a really good place. And it seems like it to me, it's going to catch the most common cases. Like if you, the common cases, you, you meant to tap this thing, but you just missed, you know, and you like tap the other thing, you would just unclick it right away. But if you go through your list 
and you close the app and you come back in later, like it's, you know, you probably meant to click all those things, right? So, um, so in that case, it makes sense just to have it be disabled. So that's yeah. a nice, elegant solve, I think. Yeah, and all because I accidentally clicked one last week. And it's like, <laughs> I gotta fix this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, that was really well done. I mentioned this last time, but working with dates is so, so tricky. So you both handled that really well. And then plus like working off the work you did with Hanson too. So it's just perfect. I love seeing that date, uh, that number of milliseconds in a constant as well. So it's really easy to understand what that number means. Mm -hmm. Good work. Cool. Are you ready to jump into the learning module then? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm going to present to you uh, the accessibility module. Um, and so this is where I could just stall. Because I actually have, I'm going to share a portion of my screen, not just a window, because um, I'm going to do a little demo that's going to open a second window. Oh, that's like pretty close to what I want. Actually. Okay. You can see my screen, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it, is it moving? Yes. OK, good. <laughs> so I'll make sure I have the ability to move things around. Or like when I change slides, you're going to see everything. Um, cool. I'll get the chat open just in case you all have questions over there. OK, so um, I'm curious, how, like how many of you, like who of you have um, encountered accessibility as a concept, web accessibility, either in your boot camps or kind of you know in your own Seeing some, okay, cool, good, good. Was it something, I don't know actually if who went to boot camps or who did kind of how you all got here. So is it something that they covered in your boot camp? Was it a topic that they talked about? Or in your own study? How do you, yeah. They didn't really talk in details, but I, the concept was explained. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Lizzie, you said you had encountered it too. Yeah, so I didn't go to a boot camp, but um, uh -huh. I started as a WordPress developer and just like I started coming across this accessibility thing. And I'm noticing in more modern resources, it's mm -hmm. less of an aside and it's like built in as a matter of fact. Like, of mm -hmm. course, you would be careful about color contrast between your fonts, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So yeah, now I see it all over the place. Which is great. It's great to see some progress in that area because it's, um, well, we'll talk, we'll talk a lot about why it's important. Um, now, I don't know if you all know, like you see like hashtag A11Y, it's not actually A-L-L-Y, so it's not ally, it's actually A11Y, and the reason is, is because there are 11 letters between A and Y. Did you know that? <laughs> um, like you see this with uh, internationalization, and like there's a bunch of words where they do this kind of thing, of contracting it by the number of letters in between. Um, I think maybe people are starting to catch on to that. That used to kind of blow people's minds. Um, so accessibility uh, is, you know, the sort of def the dictionary definition of it is the inclusive practice of ensuring there are no barriers that prevent interaction with access to websites on the World Wide Web, which just seems like such an archaic way of, uh, uh, like ar archaic thing to call that. But anyway, by people with physical disabilities, situational disabilities, we'll talk about what that means, and socioeconomic restrictions on bandwidth and speeds. So when sites are correctly designed, developed, and edited, generally users have all users have access, equal access to information and functionality. So um, you all know what the W3C is, the World Wide Web Consortium. They have a working group, um, the Web Accessibility Initiative, uh, that publishes standards. So there's, this is all, all acronym land, but it's called WCAG. It's how most people pronounce it. It's the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG. Um, there's different versions of that, and there's different levels of conformance and all these things. But um, they are sort of the the standards body for for accessibility um, in the United States. Uh, Section 508 requires government agencies to make their websites accessible for people with disabilities. Um, and Canada has similar, and actually in a lot of cases, more stringent regulations around this stuff um, just to make sure people um, can all get on the web and do what they need to do. Um, it's really funny when I, it's not funny. It's actually, is it sad? It's something, it's something when I see people sort of objecting to spending time on accessibility because um, like there was one person who's like, oh, you know, cause somebody was making the argument that, you know, you get older and you know, like, you can't see as well and stuff. And I'm like, 
old people aren't on the web. They don't need to do anything vital on the web. It's like, I think about my dad who is, he's doing all of his, like he's making doctor's appointments, he's paying his bills, he, you know, like he's doing very important things on the web and it's important that he's able to kind of access this stuff um, as easily as any of us. So um, I guess in, uh, well, sorry, I'll, I'm skipping ahead. Um, so uh, some people with disabilities, access not all people with disabilities access websites using what's called assistive technologies so you may have heard of screen readers so um you know if you're on a mac you have voiceover built in if you're on windows you have narrator built in nvda is um a a free screen reader on windows jaws is some would argue is a little bit better but it's it costs a lot of money um android ios they all have you know they all have screen readers built in Screen magnifier, speech to text, uh, dictation software, assistive keyboards, braille displays. If you've ever seen, you really want to see something cool, um, watch somebody who reads braille using a braille reader to uh, to read the web. It's transforming braille underneath their fingertips, basically, and they're just kind of reading the web the website that way. It's pretty cool. Um, and other tools, uh, high contrast mode is considered a, an assistive technology. Um, you know, assistive technologies, I mean, reading glasses, you could consider it assistive technology. And of course, you know, we're talking mostly about the web, but um, once you pay attention to it, you see them, you see these things everywhere, you know, just kind of different ways of um, using technology to help people kind of overcome barriers that are designed into the environment. That's kind of another whole other topic, but um, if we have time, we can talk about that. So while screen readers are sort of, the most commonly known and maybe the most widely used um, assistive technology doesn't just mean screen reader. All right, so why do we do this? So I started, to, I wanted to go down this track a second ago. Um, so it's the right thing to do. Um, you know, the web, you know, I've, you know, I've been working on the web since almost from the beginning and, you know, really kind of buy into the ideals of, you know, this, this tool that's going to democratize information or allow everybody to have access to all this stuff. And, you know, accessibility is one of the ways that we make sure that everyone can participate. Um, you know, I mentioned Section 508 and other regulations. So you may be legally obligated to make your website accessible. Um, and even if it's not, if you're not, like, aren't required to by regulation, um, or if that seems like a gray area to you or something, like it's, uh, people, like, websites are getting sued all the time <laughs> around accessibility. So, um, Domino's, it was a really high profile case a few years ago where um, somebody sued because they couldn't order pizza online um, with a screen reader. And Domino's spent more money fighting the lawsuit than they did, and it took them to actually just fix the website. It just didn't make any sense to me why they would, why did we do that? <laughs> why would you do that? Um, but other like Target.com, a bunch of, you know, kind of consumer brands have now been, um, have kind of found themselves in a, uh, lawsuits around this stuff so um so that's another way that you're sort of legally obligated is it's you know there's a risk to the business if you if you don't do this um a lot of people have you know some kind of disability so um you know it's estimated that 20 percent of website visitors have some kind of disability uh and that's and if you take all 20 percent of the u.s population or 20 percent of the population of the u.s that accesses websites that's more than people that live in Canada. And so if you want, you know, to like have, like if you're working on a product and you want your market to be another Canada bigger, then you should pay attention to this stuff, right? Um, and then there's benefits for people without disabilities uh, if you make your your stuff more accessible. So that's the sort of curb cut theory of, you know, I don't know how many times you go to a, an intersection and you walk down the curb cut because it's just a little bit easier than walking down the curb, right? And the curb cut isn't there for you. It's there for people with in wheelchairs or mobility scooters or, you know, uh, parents with strollers, bicycles. Like, all, there's lots of reasons why it's there, but it really does help everybody. Um, so the same, same thing holds true for web accessibility. So I mentioned situational disabilities. So... Um, Microsoft does some really amazing work around accessibility. I think this chart is actually a little outdated. They have a new, an updated one, but um, that, go, that talks a lot more about um, like neurodivergence and things too. But if you think like, I think most of us, most of the time think of 
you know, sort of permanent disability. So a person is blind and they, that's how, you know, they need a screen reader to access the web. But, um, you know, there's like you, if you're distracted while you're driving, that's almost, it's similar. Like you might want to use something that reads the web page to you so you can keep your eyes on the road. Um, you know, if you are, you know, somebody has one arm and they, they can't, you know, they can't do certain things that take two hands. Um, that's not that different than, um, you know, having an injured arm or being a, a parent with a kid in one arm. Um, anyway, you kind of get the idea. There's permanent disabilities. There are ones that, you know, are kind of temporary, like that we all could go through and then situational things even that are, um, yeah, I mean, that we all, the point, I guess, of this whole slide is that we all experience this to some degree at different times. Um, and as someone who is getting a little older and like only just had to start using glasses and things like these things, you know, it's like, we're all going to be there at some point where we're bumping up the size of the fonts and like increasing the contrast and all those kinds of things. So, um, you know, let's build an accessible web now so that when we all uh, really need these tools, it's all already in place. All right. So let's talk a little bit about how. So um, this little list of eight things isn't going to guarantee that your website's accessible, but it's a good start. And it's um, that means that you're probably not going to build in really obvious barriers. You might still, it's really easy to build things that are uh, inaccessible in really unexpected ways. But if you, um, you know, if you do kind of do these things, your, you know, your site's probably going to be generally pretty accessible for people in assistive, on assistive technology. So the first one is using just valid semantic HTML. So um, there are a lot of tags that people, like I, I actually still once in a while learn about a new HTML tag, even though I've been doing this for 25 years. Um, so, but there are tags that have, you know, specific meanings. Um, and the more you can use those tags for the thing, a thing that matches that sort of semantic meaning, then um, the more information the browser has, has to work with in terms of presenting that to, to users. Um, I mean, a really kind of table stakes thing is just always having alt attributes on your image tags. Um, what goes in the alt attribute? So, like this actually is something that can be enforced by linters, and you know, um, you know, there are tools that are that will do static analysis of your code and make sure that the alt attribute is there. The thing that those tools can't do is tell you what should be in the alt attribute. And so, there's a bit of nuance and kind of like some, um, you know, some things to know about that. I guess, uh, you know, generally that alt attribute should be. It, it, the alt attribute gets read out by the screen reader. So if you have an image on the page and there's alt text in there, when the screen reader gets to that image, it's going to read whatever's in the alt, alt attribute. So if the image is purely decorative, you would actually leave it blank. So the screen reader just skips over it because it's not providing any sort of necessary content. If it's, um, you know, what we used to do before we had good web fonts and stuff was, you know, an image that, um, was actually just text. So you could like set the typeface and do the kerning and all that kind of stuff. You know, in that case, you would have the alt attribute just match the text of the of the image. If it's a more complicated image where there's, you know, something about that image is necessary for navigating the page or it's, you know, conveying something kind of necessary, useful to the user, the alt attribute might describe whatever that is. So there's different ways that that attribute can be used, but you should always have the attribute in place. If you don't, the screen reader gets to it and it it sounds really clunky to the to a screen reader user is you know just announce that it's an image and then the person's like well what is it like i can't you know tell me what the image is right so um aria attributes or area attributes i never know how to pronounce that um use them when but only if necessary so um this uh, shopify engineering manager says the best aria is no aria at all because um, if you can use semantic HTML, you should be doing that. So ARIA is, it's, um, uh, I forget what it stands for. Anybody know what it stands for? Uh, it's like rich, uh, accessible, rich internet application, something like that. I think somebody wants to look it up. Um, it's a, it's a set of attributes you can use to, uh, add to, um, HTML tags that, sort of enhance the feet, the functionality. You could actually take a div and make it into a button using ARIA tags uh, or ARIA attributes. 
Um, you shouldn't because there is a button tag, but in cases where you need to do something and it's not um, yeah, accessible, rich internet happens. All right, thank you. Um, so use it, but use it sparingly. Only use it as kind of a last resort, um, but it is there. It's a tool that you can, you can reach for if you need it. Um, ensure all your content is reachable via keyboard. So, um, you know, you need to be able to tag to tab to all the sort of elements on your on your screen. That's not actually how most screen readers use a web page, but it is it's sort of their last resort. So there's this um, concept of a virtual cursor, and that's more, much more common. Or just skipping it around by headers and links and landmarks and stuff. But a screen reader user, you know, if, if all those things fail, they'll just try to tab through and try to get to the the thing that that um, they're not able to access. So if you can get through your entire interface using the tab key, then at least you're not completely blocking somebody from using your site. So it's kind of a, another table stakes thing. Um, ensure that all interactive elements have reasonable target sizes. So they're the WCAG, the, the standards actually define what the minimum target size is for elements. Um, I think it's 44 pixels or something for in height for the for buttons and elements or 44 pixels square and if they don't have if your element isn't that big you need to have some you know, space around it so that essentially it's the same sort of a hit surface and that's just you know like i know i miss you know like uh olivia you said you kind of missed you hit the wrong the wrong checkbox right because they're kind of close together if you're not being paying real close attention. But there are people who it's hard for them to steady their hand. And so if they, you know, if they're trying to go for that that thing, they might, you know, it's really easy to miss unless it's sort of a certain size. Um, ensure content tab ordering makes sense. Um, so, you know, that's if you were to turn the CSS off on your site and read through the page, is it in an order that's that sort of makes sense to you? Um, that's one way to kind of uh, actually test it if you wanted to. Um, color contrast, we were mentioning that before. So uh, there are standards around that. And there's um, that's a pretty controversial topic, actually. Like, there's, there's a lot of ways to measure it. And there are differing opinions. And there's some surprises in there. Um, sometimes what passes WCAG doesn't actually look like it should. It's like, that doesn't seem like a lot of contrast. But And then other times, you're like, oh, that should be fine, but it's not. So anyway, that's a whole other topic. Color contrast is important, though. Um, well. And, not, not only using color to signify state. So, um, this comes up in the in this project because you know we have you know you can put like a you know a green this and a red that depending on how how long it is until you need to buy the thing. But it shouldn't only have a color um, that's specifying that because um, it's really common for people to be colorblind. So, and red and green, red green color blindness is the most common. So, you know, if you were to use those two colors so that to someone with that um, with uh, color blindness. Those are just two different shades of gray, and they don't know what what the color is supposed to signify. Ooh, all right. So if you do all those things, might sound like a lot, <laughs> but once you get in the habit of it, um, not so bad. If you do all those things, you're you know you're going to have a like a fairly usable site for people on assistive technology. It's uh, not necessarily going to be perfect or like a great experience, but it, at least they're not going to be blocked from accessing your uh, your work. All right, I feel like I'm, I need to speed this up. Okay. Uh, oh, here it is. ARIA is Accessible Rich Internet Application. So it's um, the technical specification by our friends at the World Wide Web Consortium. And they're the same people. Well, the W3C is the same group that maintains the HTML spec. It's not the same people on those two committees, but you know what I mean. Um, so you can add, add it to your, you know, to have better control over accessibility, you can add it to your HTML. Um, if you misuse it, it actually can introduce all kinds of problems. So that's why um, that's one of the reasons to you try to find an HTML element that will actually kind of address the thing you're trying to do. Um, so really quickly, just how we use ARIA. So um, all the ARIA attributes are prefixed by ARIA. I think that's true. Are they all? Maybe there's actually role, I guess, is technically an ARIA attribute. Um, and there's a bunch of different ones, but you can, um, so let's see. Uh, so this toggle switch, right? So you're giving us a role of switched, uh, of switch, um, it's, it is checked. So that those attributes, they work together to tell the assistive technology that they're 
is a switch. It's called Wi-Fi. It uses the, the text inside the button for that and that it's in the on state. So um, that is not enough to make it this button do what you want it to do. It's not automatically going to turn the Wi-Fi off if you click it, right? Like you're still going to have to add some JavaScript and, and things to make that button kind of work. But to the user, it's going to be presented as a switch that turns on and off. So here you can, this is a, so Aria has some overlap with HTML. So you can, like I was saying, you can actually make a div act like a button. Um, the thing is that only gets you part of the way. There are a bunch of other things that the browser understands about the button tag. That's gonna make it easier for a person on assistive technology to use it that don't come along with just role equals button. So um, one thing is, you know, it's using the space key. You, want, you know, if this, if this button is focused and the user hits space, it'll actually activate the button. But I'm pretty sure that doesn't happen if it's a div with a role button. So again, another reason to uh, always use semantic HTML when you can. A lot of information, isn't it? All right, so <laughs> um, how do we identify accessibility issues for remediation? So um, I think I mentioned X before. That's this is that's a static analysis tool that um, we'll go through and you know scan for things like missing alt attributes and that kind of thing. Um, everyone should use X. It's uh, it's really easy to have that sort of even sort of in real time kind of checking your code, um, but definitely when you're committing or when you're pushing code, you should have X scans running. Um, there are you know it's built into Chrome. You can just kind of run X on it, everything um, through the Lighthouse feature uh, functionality. It's a good start, but just by the nature of the technology, it's only going to find, some people want to say 80%. People that make it say it catches 80%. The <laughs> people who've studied it say it's only catches around 30% of the issues. Um, and it's just, it's not the fault of the tool. The tool is doing everything it can, but all it can do is read the code, right? So that only gets you so far. It doesn't, you're not interacting with the, the actual rendered output. So, um, so anyway, it's it's a good tool. Great, you know, everyone should use it. It's a good start. It's not sufficient. Um, I'm gonna this is number two. I'm gonna actually do that here in a second in the demo part. So a guided audit. Um, I I like Accessibility Insights. It's a, a tool by Microsoft. Um, they have a Chrome extension and Edge extension. Um, Edge is based on Chrome. And it's really good. And if you go through the the, the whole guided audit you will actually end up knowing a lot about accessibility because it's it goes step, you know, sort of concern by concern and links off to resources. It does all this stuff to um, not only catch problems, but sort of educate you as, as it goes. So it's really nice. Um, audits by accessibility testers. So this is something, you know, if you find yourself on a product team and there's like, how do we, how do we know whether the thing we built is a good experience for somebody with using assistive technology? You can suggest, hey, you know, we could hire uh, Fable Tech Labs to come and audit the the site or the app. And the way that Fable works, they um, they have a community of people who are assistive technology users. Um, uh oh, are we gonna get thrown out? <laughs> I have no idea why it says that we are, but I so I might have to send a new link in a little bit. Sorry to. Okay. Off. Okay. No, no, that's totally fine. Um, so. Um, Fable, uh, they, they have this community testers. They're all, you know, actual, like, you know, like, um, the first person I ever worked with there is Sam Pru. He, uh, he's a blind, um, tester, uses screen readers every day. And he went through and very quickly identified some things that we needed to, to fix. So it's a great way to have, you know, actual people with disabilities, um, review your work, um, love, love Fable. And then just getting feedback from 